Okay, everyone, uh, we're going to get started. I'll just start with a few uh, administrative items. Uh, you should all have uh, your GoToWebinar panel on the right-hand side of your screen. And if you'd like, throughout the course of the webinar, you can feel free to put questions into the Questions tab, uh, which is about probably the third or fourth one down, depending on uh, how you have your GoToWebinar set up. Uh, you can feel free to put in questions as we go, and I will address ones uh, during the webinar if it makes sense for me to do so. Otherwise, I will circle back to them at the end. Uh, and you can also, if you have any uh, issues or concerns, you can put uh, that into the chat window, and my colleague uh, Alina will alert me to that or let me know if you're having uh, any issues with the slides or the sound. So thanks for joining us today. My name's Teresa Regley. I'm a principal analyst with the Real Story Group, and uh, I focus on digital and media asset management technology, very specifically and more broadly, uh, digital marketing technology, and all the ways you might be communicating with your uh, customers and prospects about uh, your business and your products. So today I'll specifically be talking about how to select digital and media asset management technology uh, and I spend a lot of time uh, following this market we have a team of analysts who follow this market very very closely uh, and today I'll be sharing with you uh, really a methodology for selection uh, and different ways that you might think about approaching the market that are perhaps uh, a little less conventional than uh, more traditional uh, approaches to product selection so let's dive right in uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Real Story Group, and I know some of you uh, are probably new to us, we have a lot of uh, new contacts on uh, the webinar today, so uh, if you are new to us, thanks a lot for, uh, for joining us for the first time. Uh, we do two primary things at Real Story Group. Uh, first and foremost is we, we write technology research um, in eight different technology markets. Um, we focus specifically on product evaluations and helping companies understand the strengths and weaknesses uh, of the products in these markets uh, and our research compares the products uh, very closely and at a very granular level of detail so that you can make sure that you're uh, making the right selections. Uh, and then we do strategic consulting where we help organizations uh, plan their technology initiatives, plan uh, their various technology choices, uh, and then we help select specifically the products that make the most sense to fit into that uh, mix of technologies. And our core differentiator, in addition to our detail and our experience uh, with these technologies, is really that we only do this work for end users and buyers. So we have no conflict of interest. We have no relationships uh, or uh, uh, we don't do work for the vendors that we evaluate. So we're, we're strictly um, free of conflicts. Uh, this is our uh, technology vendor map, and I apologize, it's a little bit uh, blurry on my screen. I just dropped this uh, into the slide deck as our latest version. Um, and for those of you who, who aren't familiar with this, um, this is one of the views that we uh, have of the marketplaces that we cover. And you can go to Real Story Group and download your very own version of this if you go to realstorygroup.com slash vendor map. Um, and each of the lines here represent uh, the different markets that we that we evaluate. And you'll note in the middle there's a, a, a lot of big names there that you're no doubt familiar with like OpenText, IBM, Microsoft, Google. They sell many, many different sorts of technologies and some of them play in this world of digital media asset management. Um, but there's also a whole world of pure play vendors who are really focused just on uh, producing and, and selling digital and media asset management products. And we'll focus a little bit on, on that question um, over the course of this webinar. Should you pick something that is a pure play vendor, uh, a vendor that really just sells media and asset management technology, or should you go with your, uh, with your big enterprise vendor that might want to sell you a suite of products, multiple products that do multiple uh, use cases or that address multiple use cases, one of which might be digital and media asset management? The answer is, is that there's not one right way to do it. Um, there's not a better way to do it. Um, it might be appropriate for you to pick uh, a product from a large vendor or it might be appropriate for you to pick something from uh, a pure play vendor. There's different factors that weigh into that and today I'm going to talk about uh, what some of those factors are. So one of the uh, key things to understand about DAM is that it's not really uh, just about managing assets anymore. Um, one of the key changes in digital asset management technology over the years has been that initially 
uh, in its early days, which at this point is, is 20 years ago for some of these systems, uh, it was really about a place or a repository to put final assets. And you produced assets outside of a system, either with a video production software or back in the day it was with things like Aldis PageMaker or uh, Quark Express. Today it's more commonly things like InDesign or Illustrator. You would produce these assets and then they would go into a final dam. Um, today digital asset management is a much broader breadth of functionality where you're producing images, uh, you're managing images in a repository, and then finally you're doing multi-channel distribution of these images. Uh, or videos or other sorts of assets and oftentimes what we think of as digital asset management is actually not just one technology but it's three or four or five technologies to take care of this whole breadth of functionality and in this particular slide I, I depict it as a hive uh, because I think of all the different people who are involved in this process as sort of worker bees that, that come in and maybe have specializations in these different uh, particular areas and that's the case with the technology vendors too. There are technology vendors that specialize in these particular um, areas that are in the different honeycombs and maybe you're somebody who's producing assets or you're somebody who's doing digital delivery. You have to figure out where do you fit into this hive and, and, and you have to think about what is the precise technology for what I need to do and what I need to accomplish. Now a lot of times when you go out shopping for a digital asset management system, you actually might see a demonstration from one vendor that, that, that really under the covers is four or five or even six or seven different technologies. Because oftentimes it's a platform that's using open source components or maybe they have partnerships with third party vendors uh, that do some of these other things rather than just provide an interface into DAM. And this is something that is becoming more and more prominent, not just in the DAM space, but even in the broader digital marketing ecosystem where you might be looking at, for example, a, a, an MRM vendor or a marketing resource management vendor or a CRM vendor, which is customer relationship management. And some of those tools have DAM components as well. They might let you store images. They might let you distribute images along with uh, certain types of information about products. So the point of this is really to think about and just make sure you're aware that what you're seeing in product demonstrations is often covering many, many different pieces of this equation and in fact you might be looking at multiple products at the same time that you would be buying from one vendor. So it's a complex uh, hive of activity here that we have in this space. Uh, dam is not a silo anymore, so when you think about picking a dam, you can't think about doing it in a, in a silo. Uh, this is an example of where these uh, systems tend to fit together, and we call this a marketing services reference model. So if you're a marketer, or you're working with a, uh, a marketing team, maybe you're working with a, a multi-channel um, distribution team of some kind, oftentimes you're dealing with multiple sources of data, and then you have a dam system that might need to use that data to specifically process, send out, distribute assets um, in a very, very specific way. And that, that specific way might be based on customer segmentation. Uh, it might be based on social media channels and what you know about the people that are engaging with you on the social media channels. It might be based on uh, purchasing habits of your customers. It might be based on website behavior as another example. And you need all these technologies to work together to actually distribute to these distribution channels and through these other technology layers. So this is really advice number two, right? Advice number one was think about the fact that the dam usually isn't just one piece of technology, it's, it's part of a, of a larger ecosystem. Also remember that this, these systems have to work together using many different types of enterprise data in order to distribute effectively through uh, through other technology layers and also out to uh, multi-channel. So you need to have this bigger picture uh, of your larger ecosystem before you go in um, and select a dam. I like to use the uh, analogy of a cocktail. I often talk about uh, technology cocktails that might be because I'm someone who enjoys cocktails, both drinking them and making them. Um, and I often feel that when uh, you get in a situation of, of thinking about how your technology fits together, you have to be as precise uh, as a craft cocktail bartender. Uh, you have to think about what are the right balances of the technologies that I'm going to that I'm going to use. 
and also how do I make sure that I know which technology is taking care of which tasks. I've, I've been in this conversation so much recently with uh, many of our research subscribers, many of our consulting clients where they say, well, should I have my DAM do this task or should I have my web content management system do this task? Uh, should I have my CRM do this task or should I have my MRM do this task? And the reality is it's not necessarily black and white. You need to understand what functional things you need to accomplish, but then you need to decide, okay, what's the system of record for this? And then you need to bring that together in a unified uh, user experience. It's really not easy, um, and it's making the selection of these pro products uh, honestly a much more complex uh, equation. So here's uh, the obligatory logo ocean, uh, I sometimes call it. <laughs> and when it comes to digital marketing, there are so many vendors out there. Um, and this is really a, 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 not even all of the ones out there that are selling marketing technology. Uh, these are just the ones that we cover and that uh, whose products we evaluate. Um, but in reality, there's apparently at last count over 2,000 vendors in the marketing technology space. Um, you know, we look at, at at about 150 that are focused here, and these are really the ones that are um, uh, very uh, basically much more focused on um, enterprise businesses, larger businesses, um, more than smaller ones. So. You've got the digital and media asset management uh, bubble in the middle there, and uh, these are the vendors that are that are focused on uh, image management, video management, and and what I like to call compound asset management. So things like catalogs and uh, things that are created with Adobe Creative uh, Suite products uh, that are often uh, destined for multi-channel. And you can see there's a lot of them there. Uh, we we look at 44 um, at last count, and some of these vendors have multiple products. Uh, and that's because those multiple products address different use cases. Some of them are focused on print uh, distribution of assets and production. Others are focused more on the digital side or mobile distribution of marketing assets and such. So a lot of diversity here. Um, and as you look at this, you might be a little overwhelmed. You might say, well, if I'm, if I'm approaching this, how am I going to go in and actually um, decide what to pick? And, and maybe you're somebody that already has a, a product and you might be unhappy. <laughs> so there's sort of two situations I would set up here. Uh, you might A, not have a product yet and you're wondering how to approach it, or you might be one of these um, people here, which is uh, someone with an existing product. And, and one of the things we found in our surveys, uh, we do a lot of uh, quantitative survey research, and we did a survey last year where we found out that, that basically buyers and implementers of DAM products are not happy. So a lot of people who come to us, uh, they're, they're, they want to divorce their vendor essentially. They want to move away uh, from the vendor they have um, because, let's face it, any relationship that's a, a five on a scale of one to ten is, is not a particularly uh, good one. So if you're in either of these situations, where might you be uh, moving? Another reason uh, people tend to be thinking about moving away from an existing vendor and, and picking a new one is because of the shift to the cloud. Uh, a lot of DAM vendors historically have not done uh, implementations in the cloud. They've, they've been on-premise implementations that have required a lot of very heavy uh, investment in IT and investment in IT resources. And, and one of the things we found in our survey as well is that there is a, a, a quite a dramatic shift of organizations wanting to move from an on-premise installation to a cloud-based installation. And this is where sometimes they look at their existing vendor and they say, oh, well, they don't really have a, a, a history of supporting this, so I want to look at something something new. So let's talk about some of these considerations and where you might um, start thinking about uh, vendors. Let's, let's first talk about cloud and cloudability. Uh, one of the key factors in, in picking a dam these days is do you want to have it on-premise uh, or would you like it? In the cloud, uh, do you want to alleviate your IT group of some of the burden of managing, uh, you know, these systems? And this is uh, actually a new aspect of our research, where we're taking all the vendors that we we cover in the DAM space and we're we're ranking their capability uh, to deliver in the cloud uh, versus on premise. And this is my my first uh, my first cloudability spectrum, I call it, um, of the DAM space. So. This is looking at about 25 uh, key vendors in this space, 
and on the far left, you've got uh, you've got vendors that are more commonly um, installed, or I should say, their systems are more commonly installed on premise. Versus uh, on the right hand side, you have uh, vendors that are are far more cloud oriented, or in some cases, like Widen Binder, a uh, 100% cloud uh, vendors. In fact, that's the only um, sort of uh, offering they have. And this is presented to just give you a perspective on, again, one is not necessarily better than the other. Uh, there's still a lot of companies out there that are much more uh, comfortable, much more inclined um, to, to deliver things on premise, and that might be because they have uh, very deep um, integration needs, and they would rather have that on premise um, than have to do it through um, a cloud-based vendor, as an example. Um, or they have the IT resources to support it, and they would rather, they would rather do that themselves. Maybe they have you know their own relationship with a uh, with a hosting provider, and thus they want to do something that maybe is more of a hybrid um, sort of situation. Uh, but this is a key consideration when it comes to selecting systems: is is how do you want to manage it? Where do you want it installed? Uh, and if you are in in this shift towards cloud-based uh, uh, sorts of hosting models, you might want to be looking at the vendors more towards the right. Uh, and if you're more in an environment where you're used to having things on premise. Um, and maybe you have your own services team or an integration partner that you work with, you might be want to look more towards uh, the, the left there. Okay, let's, let's talk about um, selection process here, and um, we'll specifically walk through this methodology that uh, we've, we've used for, frankly, quite a long time, um, 12 years now that we've been uh, helping customers uh, pick systems. And we, we look at it as a funnel, really, where you've got um, s different steps, and you think about filters. Uh, what are the filters that you're going to use to create a short list of vendors that are appropriate for you? Uh, who should you then eventually send an RFP or an RFD to? Uh, and then finally, getting into vendor demos and a, a bake-off or a, a POC. And uh, in each of these phases, there's different ways that you can narrow down uh, and specifically decide you know who's who's the right vendor for me, and I'll, I'll walk you through some of these filters that we recommend that you apply, and then I'm going to show you. Uh, we actually uh, have an app uh, on our website for our research subscribers that you can use, and you can play with different criteria to kind of figure out uh, which ones are most appropriate for you. So the first thing uh, I always say, and and this is uh, this is something that that our our whole team at Real Story Group is is pretty obsessive about, uh, which is what are your use case scenarios. Um, I believe one of the, the greatest mistakes you can make is to spend a lot of time obsessing over the traditional approach to detailed business requirements. Um, really what you need to do is, is think about a story. Um, what do you need to do with your assets? Uh, because the difference, the real difference between these systems, especially in the dam space, is not really what they do, uh, it's how they do it. So it's kind of like buying a car. Um, you know, the large majority of cars all have four wheels, and they get you from point A to point B, and they have a few doors, and they have a trunk, and and they all pretty much operate the same way. Um, the the fundamental things that they do differently is in the is in the differentiators, right? Um, is it a leather interior? Is it a stick shifter? Is it an automatic? Um, how are you changing the gears? You know, these cars they all change gears, but how do you do it? Um, do you have more control over how it's done, or are you going to let it um, sort of take its own? Uh, take its own decision as far as when it's going to change gears. That's really uh, the way it is with these systems as well. So if you go through a process of documenting lots and lots and lots of requirements, uh, vendors are generally going to come back and say, yes, of course, we can do all that. Uh, but if you tell a story of how you want your assets to move through a workflow and how it gets modified and what connections need to happen to other systems, where data is coming from, how you need to communicate with your customers, uh, you're going to have a, a better differentiating story. Uh, we take all the vendors in uh, the dam space and we have, we rate them against uh, scenarios like this. And when we first did research in this space about eight years ago, uh, we found a, a really wide breadth of use cases and approaches for how people were using digital asset management systems, uh, and we we parsed it into these different uh, these different scenarios. So, if you're a company that's focused on advertising and marketing asset management as well as uh, maybe multi-channel publishing. There's vendors that are very, very strong in those areas versus uh, maybe you'd have more basic needs. Maybe you just need an, need an image library. And one of the things I constantly see organizations doing is overbuying. Uh, they tend to say, well, I want a future proof or I want to buy something that, that does you know, 100% of what I need. 
Um, and in that case, is I, I literally see organizations spending hundreds of thousands of dollars more uh, than they need to, and then they end up only using 40% of the system's functionality. So I would caution you there, uh, focus in on, on the use cases that you actually need to accomplish, uh, and then you can really filter down your vendors into a very specific uh, shortlist rather quickly. And as I mentioned in our research, we, we rank all the vendors based on how well they perform in these scenarios using these very nifty little things called Harvey Balls that I'm sure many of you um, are familiar with. So once you've figured out your scenarios and, and sort of where you fit in that uh, equation, then you have to think about technology. Um, and when I say technology, I mean you know, what kind of code base is this written in? Do we have the, uh, do we have the team, the technical team to support it? Uh, and, and are we going to be able to handle a product of, of this particular uh, flavor? So I, I just had a discussion a couple days ago with a, with a customer about the fact that um, they mostly have Java technologies in-house. We were talking about a Microsoft-oriented technology. So you have to think about if you don't have .NET developers, uh, is that the right choice? So thinking about what the technology fit is. Then thinking about partner fit. So does this company understand my industry? Does this company understand... Uh, me and my group and what I'm trying to accomplish. Do they have experience with this sort of uh, situation, with this with this sort of uh, implementation? And you have to be very careful here because what we often see as well is uh, a vendor will send a response to an RFP or an RFD and they might put forth uh, a, a bunch of examples that uh, or a bunch of partners even, implementation partners, who don't necessarily uh, know the technology as well as they should uh, or just recently signed a partnership contract and so they don't necessarily have the experience with, with the technology or with your industry. So you really want to vet um, the team uh, as best you can. And then finally, value. So this speaks a little bit to what I was talking about before, whereby you need to make sure that there's a good value for your budget. Um, what I often find is that the most expensive products um, are often maybe only 5 or 10% more feature rich um, than products that cost 40% less. Um, so you have to decide really if it's worth that extra money and whether you're going to use uh, that higher end functionality to make it worth uh, spending the money there. So this is just breaking this down into a, a another level of a little bit more granular detail. Thinking about can this team support me based on the region that I'm in? Maybe what kind of licensing model do you want as well? Are you interested in open source versus commercial? Uh, delivery models, we talked about that already as far as um, SaaS and, and the cloud ability of, of these tools. And then finally, the technologies um, that you might want to investigate, whether you have the skill set in-house or not. Um, so before I go into these last few slides, I'm just going to go um, to my web browser here real quickly and just show you the app that we have. And this is a tool that we offer to our research subscribers on, on how, to, how to use those filters that I just talked about. Uh, and, and actually apply that to your selection process. So we have two ways to approach it where you either can go in, if you already know what vendors you want to compare, uh, you specifically can, can click on this link here, which is, let's say you know that you want to compare open text in North Plains, you can go in and, and do that specifically. But if you really have no idea and you'd like to actually go in and, and, and have us kind of guide you through the process, um, that's something that, that you can do with this app. So those filters that I just talked about you know, what's your technology preference? Um, do you have a specific technology preference or do you not? So let's pretend that, you know, I do. Um, I know that, that my team is already, uh, you know, completely Java oriented. So I don't want to, I don't want to look at .NET or Perl or Python or any of those. Um, licensing, you know, do I want to consider commercial, commercial open source or community? Uh, you know, I, I decided I, I really want a commercial vendor so I can check that off. And let's say I haven't really made a decision on on-premise versus cloud. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep myself more open to that. Uh, this technology, specifically our, our app here, is going to filter that for me. And then I can specifically pick my use case scenario. So I mentioned use cases and scenarios as key criteria. Uh, let's say I, I know that I really want to do um, audio and video approval. Uh, maybe I want to do multilingual and um, some multi-channel publishing. I can finish it off, and then it's actually going to give me um, some appropriate vendors for that, for these scenarios, and it's going to give me the ratings on those particular vendors. And then, of course, if I, if I want to go into the next level of detail, it's actually going to let me generate a report that compares these various vendors. Uh, so these filters are, are, again, proven over time. We've been using these for a very long time. 
uh, and this gives this gives you uh, as as a as a customer of ours uh, the the empowerment to be able to go in and even decide if you want to hone in on better fits, uh, which will narrow down the vendor even more, um, or say the vendor list even more, versus if you want to change any of your criteria here, you can do that. Um, so honing in on this is is really important. Um, and you can use these criteria, which are just really so much more valuable than a long list of requirements, um, to get to the short list uh, that you need. So just toggle right back here to my uh, slide deck and just talk about, um, again, how to use these filters and, and, and uh, apply them in the best way possible. So RFPs or RFDs, requests for demos, um, again, scenarios are better than long lists of requirements. Uh, we've seen them time and time again be much more effective, um, and that's why we've built those into our, into our selection app um, in the way that we have. When you decide to have vendors in for a demo, just make sure uh, the right people are represented. Uh, make sure the demos aren't canned. So we always say, send them a sample of your own assets. Uh, send them a sample of your own data. Uh, that's how we do it at Real Story Group too. We we have the vendors um, demo, uh, if possible, with our own uh, materials. And this is uh, this is a much more effective approach. So you can compare apple to apples, apples to apples, I should say, uh, and keep it consistent and and see the same capabilities across the board. And then finally, what we always recommend is to have a competitive proof of concept or a bake off. I, I used a car analogy earlier, and I'll use it again. You know, usually you take a test drive before you buy a car, uh, and we should do the same thing with software, especially if there's a, a half a million dollar contract on the line. Um, we always recommend doing this with the final two vendors, uh, where you take your scenarios, your actual content, real people in a real environment, and this also gives you time to negotiate. Um, and some people say, well, we don't really have time for that. We're just going to sign the contract and start implementation. But frankly, if you pick the wrong product and you never got your hands on the product before buying it, uh, it it's going to be much more expensive than uh, than a failed uh, than than the time you would have spent conducting a POC. So, don't skip this step. And even if you're wise enough to buy some good research and and pick a product um, using effective research or bringing a a, a a market expert in to help you make the selection. Um, you should always do this step, always, always, always. If you've got two vendors, um, always do a bake-off uh, and, and make sure that you're making the right final choice. And then finally, make sure that you uh, understand the licensing. It's really hard to compare apples to apples. Um, in this case, um, there was a, a client who asked me the other day uh, about a vendor and said, oh, they're proposing $236,000 uh, as a cost. Is that is that a good price? And it was really really impossible for me to answer that question because I didn't have this context, right? This is the context that allows you to understand whether or not you're getting a good price because these vendors, they, they charge per seat, um, number of concurrent users, number of, of named users, or sometimes it's just a flat number of people who can log on at any given time. Sometimes it's per server, sometimes it's by volume or asset increasingly with these systems moving into the cloud. More and more of the pricing is based on asset, volume, uh, etc. And uh, that's the kind of consideration. So you can't look at a price in a vacuum. You have to understand the details of what's being proposed and whether or not they're pricing per module. Sometimes when an initial price is given, it's just for the base software. It's not actually for all the additional modules. Uh, so make sure you understand these details and, uh, and, and of course, uh, make sure that um, you, you have somebody who, who can help you negotiate. So again, just to summarize, make sure it's a testable process. Make sure at each stage you're narrowing down and reducing your risk uh, via these different filters that I talked about, via the filters that I talked about in our app, um, and then finally test via head-to-head -head pilots. And then I'll just uh, close it off. This is my last slide um, with our reality check. And and this is uh, this is highly analyzed in our research. Um, this is not something that rank ranks vendors. That's the first thing I like to say. This is a rate of vendor change. Uh, there is no good or bad place to be on this chart. So it is not meant to uh, have you look at a particular block and say, oh, there's the best vendor. Um, I can't emphasize enough that there are no best vendors. Uh, there are appropriate vendors that fit your situation. Uh, so I get, uh, frankly, quite exasperated when someone asks me, well, what's what's the, the best vendor or what's the, quote, better tool? Um, you know, I'm somebody who lives in the middle of a city. I don't need a car, all right? I can walk. My best tool are my feet and a bicycle occasionally. You know, whereas if you live somewhere where you have to drive a lot and you have to be in a car, then maybe you want a fancy car and you want to drive it around. So think about what is the best appropriate tool for your situation. 
it's not about um, what the best tool is in a vacuum. So this particular chart is measuring vendor change along the horizontal uh, uh, the horizontal um, plane. How fast is this vendor changing? Are they acquiring? Are they firing? Did they just replace their CEO? Are they adding a lot of new staff very quickly versus product change along the right-hand side? So how fast does this product morph? How fast does it add new features? How fast does it roll out uh, patches and upgrades and things like that? Or is this vendor in a, a state of rolling out a new version right now? So the, the, vent, the vendors that are listed towards the top are either brand new products very recently or are rolling out new products very recently and the ones that are on the far right are vendors that are changing very recently maybe they took a big investment uh, or they're hiring very rapidly or they've recently been acquired as an example um, so this is a way for you to decide well what kind of vendor do you want you know it's kind of like choosing a mate you know maybe some people want a, a, a partner who's going to stay home with them and 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 not be too active, or and some people like um, partners that are that are going to take them um, rock climbing and skydiving. So it's kind of the same thing when you pick a vendor. Um, you have to be ready for the ride, and you have to understand what you're going to to get out of it. And so if you want a vendor that's a little bit more slow moving and maybe isn't going to be throwing um, new features in your face every every month, uh, you might want to stay at the bottom left of the chart. Um, if you are uh, someone who's looking for a vendor to stretch you in new directions and is going to constantly be innovating and throwing out new features at you, uh, then you might want to go a little bit more uh, to the top uh, right of this chart. So that's another uh, another filter that you can think about, another tool to help you um, select uh, the most appropriate product. So I've thrown out a whole bunch of different ways to look at the market today. Um, I've thrown out a whole bunch of different filters and, and different uh, ways to consider. Um, this is our business, Real Story Group, and we, we help people do this all the time. Um, we have hundreds of subscribers to our research who uh, we're advising on an ongoing basis. So I invite you to visit our website and get a little better sense of what we do. If you're not already a customer, please feel free to download um, our research. You can also play with our tool, um, but you would not get access to all the results without being a subscriber, of course. Uh, but feel free to look at our homepage and go right into the real-time app, uh, and you can, you can play with those filters yourself and have a better understanding of how they might work. Again, I'm Teresa Regley. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter there as well, at Real Story Group, or my own handle there, which is at Teresa Regley. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us for a future webinar, and uh, hope that you will become a customer if you are not already. Thanks so much. Signing off. Have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.